Nonfiction was already on the rise when James Frey's memoir came out in 2003. You may remember it. It was called A Million Little Pieces, and it exploded in popularity when Oprah added it to her book club. It blew up even more when just a few months later, a report came out that showed huge sections of the book were made up. I, I don't know what is true, and I don't know what isn't. So first of all, I wanted to start with, with the smoking gun report titled The Man Who Conned Oprah. The events that the report looked at were easy to disprove. Frey said he was in jail for months, for example, and it turned out to be just a few hours. The investigation looked at police reports and court records, documents that showed the facts. The publisher clearly hadn't done much due diligence when it came to fact-checking. But what happens when someone is just misremembering, recalling things that happened a long time ago? What if the truth isn't so easy to prove? In 2010, when author Tom McAllister published his memoir, Bury Me in Jersey, he had to ask himself those questions. A big part of that memoir is uh, revolves around my father's death. He died when I was 21 uh, in 2003. So a lot of scenes were reconstructed memories of stuff I did with my dad in the 90s, basically, uh, including having to figure out did he actually say this? Do I remember this correctly? Did we actually go to this game together that I thought we went together? In the years following the Frey scandal, things had changed a bit. McAllister had to work with his publisher's lawyers to fact check his work, though they weren't concerned about every single detail. I mean, their main charge is to make sure Random House doesn't get sued. And so it seemed like they were worried, especially about libel. Like I had an uncle who was described in a, the draft that they had as a drunk and a loser. And we had to cut drunk because I couldn't document that he, um, I felt that drunk is a subjective term. <laughs> Uh, but it turns out, uh, from the lawyer's perspective, it was not at all. McAllister is one of three memoirists I talked to who shared their takes on what makes memoir nonfiction. I think most savvy readers understand that, you know, there's this sort of parenthetical after, you know, the statement when a memoirist says, this is the truth, parentheses, as it felt to me, close parentheses. Author Kathleen Rooney says she thinks what James Frey did was unethical, blatant lying. But she also likes that memoir leaves room for subjectivity. Sometimes um, the pretense of objectivity can be pretty damaging, and so I like that the memoir just doesn't pretend that. Rooney's memoir, Live Nude Girl, blends her experience as an art model with art history. Memoir kind of offers this opportunity to think about the difference between big, institutional, collective truth in harmony or in tandem with small, individual, subjective truth. For her, memoir is an opportunity to tell a nonfiction story using the techniques of fiction. You can create scenes and imagery. You might even have dialogue. And of course, you know, dialogue is a great example of what I'm getting at where, you know, when I was art modeling, I didn't literally sit there for 10 years, like with a recorder, making sure that I got everything that every artist or student said. But I do, I have dialogue in there and it is, you know, reported dialogue, recalled dialogue. So I did my best in a good faith way. Author Meredith Clark did record hers in real time as letters to a baby she thought she was going to have. Ultimately, her pregnancy resulted in a miscarriage. I don't really think that I had a choice <laughs> in this, in this case. One of her favorite things about memoir is that it has so much flexibility. I think ultimately that's why the material found itself in that garment um, was that memoir just has so much generosity and capacity. The title of Clark's book, Liar Bird, is a metaphor for her memoir. It's the name of an Australian bird whose mating call is an imitation of whatever it hears in its environment. There are these lyre birds that live in a forest that play this flute song that somebody used to play back in the Australian forest in the 1940s. <laughs> um, or there are lyre birds in the zoo that will mimic the sound of a zoo enclosure being built, uh, like the hammer on the roof. And it's just this incredible gift. The lyre bird, she says, is the ultimate memoirist. For Philosophy Talk, I'm Shireen Adin.